Hello. What happened to those people who usually sit here? Where are they? We're going to mark them tardy, mark them absent. You know, when you were in school, did they give you stars to put on your thing? Stars, you know, red stars, silver stars, gold stars. I don't know. Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. Now, why I'm asking about stars, I don't know, except that I have three stars in the making. And these are three students from the University of Illinois who are part of the Ebert Fellows. They were chosen from many, many, many applicants. And each year, we try to choose three. And we are so fortunate. You know, Michael Phillips, who you all know and love from the Chicago Tribune, also heads that program. He's the mentor to the Ebert Fellows. And one of the things that he does that I, I love is he makes sure in the beginning he takes them, he does so much mentoring with them. He teaches them how to conduct interviews. He teaches them how to look critically, how to look critically at an article, whether it's about film. He's taken them to Second City so that they can watch comedy shows and improvisation. And he teaches them how to interview comedians, and also how to dissect what comedy is. It's such an important program because most of our other programs are only maybe a week or two weeks long, or we take someone to a film festival. But the Ebert Fellows here at the University of Illinois get a chance to go for a longer period of time for the semester. And this year, for the first time, I'm going to take one of the Ebert Fellows to the Cannes Film Festival with me next month. So um, we just try to do so many things with them. But I'd like to inter inter introduce the first three. First, let's have our, their mentor, Michael Phillips, come out on stage with me. Would you like to say anything about yeah, the Ebert I, Fellows? Yeah, I'll, I'll just say that uh, it's always, the work always, the work we do all year always culminates here at Ebert Fest, and it's, it's the, the single greatest way to end um, a, a full school year of activity. Uh, we, we, we begin by throwing them in the deep end at the Chicago International Film Festival with absolutely no guidance or training, or we hardly met. And, uh, and then by now, you know, this is, it's really, it's really always a wonderful kind of, few months and then to end it here is just great and we um, I don't know it's always it's it's always a real uh, life changer in, in different directions and um, if you don't mind can I just can I just bring them out should we should we name them and bring oh, them out yeah, huh? yes, okay good yes. here we are this is Eunice Alpasan, Perry Apostolakos and Curtis Cook this year's Roger Ebert fellows from the College of Media <laughs> University of Illinois stars in the making. Um, I keep in touch with the Ebert Fellows after they graduate, and we have students who are doing all kinds of things, and I'm really proud of them, and I know Roger would be so proud to know that this program uh, is something that we started. He, he, he didn't know about this program. We started after he passed away, and he would be very proud of it, so thank you, and they are stars in the making. Now, Someone, I hear, a, I hear a cell phone. Can, it's, I hope it's not in my purse. 
but that is one thing. One year, you know, one year I talked about how proud I was that at Ebert Fest, you didn't see people checking their phone to see what time it was or checking email messages. And for some reason, the very next year, we had uh, just a, 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 so many people checking phones. And we had to actually, for the first time from the stage, ask people, up. Oh, I see a phone up there. I mean, I'm serious. I, I'm, I'm going to tell you this. At the movies, <laughs> what? What is that? Is that you? Oh, Christina. Oh. Oh, you know what? This is actually the head of the Illinois Film Office. And she brought us great gifts yesterday. If you see those little Illinois film hats around, you, you may actually take one if you see one. Not if it looks like it belongs to someone, but um, she brought us hats and other posters. We decor she did everything decorated with posters that you'll see over at the Hyatt. So thank you, Christine. Thank you. So now we get to a film that I am so, so very proud to present because it was, took about 47 years, I believe, before people actually got to see it at a proper premiere. It's a film called Cane River. It was made by a filmmaker named Horace Jenkins, and he was, his, his daughter will talk about him a little bit. He was fantastic. When you hear his credentials, he sounds like a character that should be in a, you know, in a, in a novel. And I hope that they actually make a film about him because he had a remarkable life. And this movie, Cane River, was put away in a vault, <coughs> excuse me, and Sandra Schulberg of Indie Collect saw the footage and really wanted to preserve it. She read the, about the history of it. She found Horace Jenkins' descendants she went really, she worked hard. She became obsessed with getting this movie preserved and she did it and she's here to present the movie, Sandra Schulberg of Indie Collect. She's gonna tell you about the movie second. But first I'd like to introduce Horace Jenkins' daughter, Dominique Jenkins and his son, Sasha Jenkins, who also is a filmmaker, Dominique and Sasha. Thank you, Thank you. Hi. Oh and, and, oh, and one thing I forgot to mention, Sasha's new film about the Wu-Tang Clan is coming out when? Uh, May 10th on Showtime. Okay. Yeah. The film is called Of Mikes and Men. And it's really good. Anyway, thank you for coming. I really appreciate it. It's a tremendous honor to be here. Chaz has been a tremendous champion of this movie. In fact, helped to um, put funds together so that we could bring it to you today. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about my dad. He was, uh, he was a really cool guy. He was fun. Um, he was the kind of person that would give you the shirt off his back. Uh, the most important thing, though, for my father was education. Very, very important to him, number one, because people can come around and take away everything from you. You can lose your home, your car, your job, but one thing can never be removed from your mind is your education, number one. And he used to say to me as a child, you know, I could have made a lot more money, Dominique, but I decided to devote my life to education and educational television. So uh, one of the things I want to let you know about him is that he was the first director of Sesame Street. And I want you to know his credentials and I want you to know about him. Because when you see the movie, number one, you're going to enjoy it. 
You're going to love it. You're going to feel good. And that's really important. But I want you to know where he was born and where he was raised. He was born in Scranton, Pennsylvania. And at one year old, uh, my grandparents moved to Philadelphia. So he's a Philadelphia man. And uh, some great people have grown up in that beautiful town. But he decided that uh, he wanted to get his education in France, and he went to the Sorbonne, and he studied film at the Sorbonne. And when he came back, he met my mother, and literally six weeks later, they were married and off to Saudi Arabia, where he opened one of the very first television stations in Saudi Arabia for CBS. And, he, and when you work in Saudi Arabia, you work for the king. So he worked for King Faisal. I was born in Lebanon because King Faisal flew my parents to Beirut, where I was born at the American University Hospital there. Now, the reason why I'm telling you these things is that I want you to understand who made this film. This is a very, this is an educated person. This is a person that traveled all over the world. My father spoke four languages. English, French, Italian, and Arabic. He was about six feet, six foot one, with hazel eyes, and a very sweet and charming person. And it's important for you to know, because this film, when you see it, it is the embodiment of who he is. Another thing I think that's very important about this film is that I feel that African Americans are over-sexualized in movies and television. And that is not what you're gonna see in this movie. There is not gonna be gratuitous sex, but there's gonna be a lot of love and fun, which I think you're going to enjoy. Um, I think that if this movie was seen, uh, he was trying to get this movie distributed in 1982 when it came out. It was going to, we were working to get it distributed through Warner Brothers and unfortunately he died. He died very young at 42. Don't smoke cigarettes, please. It ended his life. Um, so he died and then uh, the film went underground and you're going to hear Sandra Schulberg talk about it. She discovered it, and I'm gonna let her handle that. But um, another thing you need to know about my dad is that he had a very special way of bringing people into his big tent. He was an internationalist. He traveled the world. We lived in Paris, we lived in Ethiopia, we lived in New York City twice, we lived in Los Angeles, we lived in Washington, D.C. He was a professor of film at Howard University for a while. He also, in 19, either a 78 or 79, he won an Emmy for a children's show he did called 30 Minutes. It was a version, it was a kid version of 60 Minutes. And it was an excellent, excellent show. If you have a chance, I'm sure you can catch it on YouTube. But him being an international person was very important to me. And I couldn't have done any of the things that I've done in my life. And I'm not going to bore you with those things. But I've done some things that some women have never done. And some African American people have never done. I've been the first to do it. And the reason why I have been able to do the things that I've been able to do is because of he taught me how to dream and to think outside of the box. Dreaming is very important. And that's where all things start. Dreaming is the seed. And we have to encourage that. And that's what Roger Ebert, I think, believed in. It was so important to him, was dreaming, thinking outside of the box. Especially these days, we have to think out of the box so that we can go forward. Another thing I want you to know, my dad was very, he loved America, and he was very proud of being an American. And our family, the Jenkins family, Jenkins Bird, my father's real name is Horace Bird Jenkins III. And our family hails from Virginia, and we go all the way back, and we have fought in almost every war, including the Revolutionary War. So our family is American, and we're very proud of that fact. And m making this movie, the thing that's really cool about it is it's not just, there's not just love in it, but there's American history. 
And that's woven into the movie. And that's important because my father loved this country, as my brother and I do. So I hope you understand and feel that. Then one more thing, and then I'm going to go away. The thing that's really cool uh, that I learned when the film was shown in New Orleans recently at the New Orleans Film Festival was that I got to meet the cast. And uh, I was 17 when he died, unfortunately. And the cast taught me and told me so many things. One of the things is he got people to do things in the film that they had never done before. So the movie is black written, directed, produced, acted, and funded by completely African-American funds. And it's very unusual to have a film completely created by African-Americans. And I think that's really excellent. So here's my brother. Uh, I wasn't born in Lebanon, I was just born in Philly. Um, <laughs> but I've heard I was conceived in Ethiopia. I'm, that's a little bit too much information. Um, <laughs> I was really young when my father died, and my parents had split. We were living in Silver Spring, Maryland, and about 1977, we moved to Astoria, Queens, and, oh, Astoria in the house. Are you from Astoria? What high school did you go to? All right. I went to Bryant High School, guys, with Ethel Merman. The theater is called the Ethel Merman Theater. Um, Anyway, so my parents split, and we moved to Queens, and he was living in Harlem. And my mother told me to go outside and play back when kids went outside. And I had a football, and people had magic markers, and people were doing music and writing on things. And I was like, well, what is this? Well, this is graffiti, and this is hip hop. This is hip hop was being born, and I was in the middle of it. And I remember one of the last conversations I had with my father was, he talked about meeting a guy named Africa Bambata, who was one of the pioneers of hip-hop. And he talked about how hip-hop was really interesting to him. And I told him, well, I'm a graffiti writer, and I write on trains. And he was like, OK, tell me about it. He found it interesting. And so I had the benefit of being raised by my mom, who happens to be from Haiti. She is an American, but um, she's an American now. But you know, she was an artist, and my father was a filmmaker. And between the two of them, I believe they're my uh, greatest influences. But my father, as a documentary filmmaker, had an interest and saw value in hip hop. I would go on to publish my own magazines and produce lots of film and television and hip hop. And I believe he'd be really interested in some of the things that I've done. And I'm very thankful that I had the opportunity to be raised by such wonderful folks. Um, and Chaz is, has been a great champion, along with Indie Collect, of the film. And very quickly, and Sandra will come out and give you more information, about three years ago, I decided to Google my father. I had never seen Cane River in my life. I didn't have the benefit of seeing it. An article came up in the Times about the film, and it mentioned how my father died tragically at 42, and you know, the film had all this great promise, and no one had ever seen it. So I contacted Indy Collect, and I said, hey, that's my dad. I'm a filmmaker. And we got together, and then there were more articles in NPR and the Times, and you know, Chaz, and all these wonderful things have been happening. And, I don't know if my father told me to Google him because Google wasn't around when he was alive, but I can't explain half of the things that I do today. I didn't go to film school uh, for any of this. My father, although my sister says he was educated, he was, but his education came from also doing things. And I learned from my parents that actually doing things is the best education you can get. So I'm very thankful that I also learned that from them. So. Thanks for having us. Hope you enjoy the film. And just knowing a little bit about Horace Jenkins' background, I think really will help in the enjoyment of the movie. And I want to also, before we bring out the um, star of the movie, I'd like to bring out Sandra Schulberg from Indie Collect, whose efforts help bring this movie to light. I forgot there is one other really important thing to say about Sandra Schulberg. Some of you have heard Roger's stories about going to the Cannes Film Festival and having, there was one particular party that he talked about a lot. 
because he went to a party at this beautiful chateau outside of Cannes. And he, this, at this night, you know, there's something called the noses. They're the ones who make perfume, and they have very educated noses. There are very few true perfume, you know, the, the guys who really have the nose for perfume, and they're called, um, and this was in Grasse, the city, so it was the noses of Grasse, les, les nez du gars. But anyway, um, at this party, someone had taken flower petals and torn them and put them around on the floor. And at this party, Roger loved that people were rolling around in the rose petals and the noses of grass were guessing the essences and the scents. And it was a wild party. That took place at Sandra Schulberg's chateau. <laughs> oh, gosh. <laughs> well, it's true that for several years, when I was developing a movie about the early days of the perfume industry, I was able to buy kilos and kilos of the special petals that are used for, for perfume from the growers of grass. And it was thrilling to see, to see Roger <laughs> rolling around in the rose petals. <laughs> and he, he wrote about that in our guest book. And then a couple of years ago, Chaz came out. And we found Roger's cute drawing of one of the noses of grass in the guest book. And Chaz signed her name under Roger's name. It was, it was touching. And this whole movie is touching. Uh, Chaz spoke yesterday so eloquently about you know, empathy and what this festival is all about and family. And I must say that embarking on the restoration of Cane River has been a very emotional journey for, for Sasha and Dominique, whom you heard speak about her extraordinary father, and for me. And we've gotten, we've become a family of our own. Uh, we got to know, Chaz and I got to know a lot of the people, the original family that made Cane River when we were in New Orleans together. And that was really extraordinary. I'm going to talk more about the restoration after the film. I just want to thank Chaz for having helped to make this restoration possible because the Roger and Chaz Ebert Foundation is the main source of the funds we use to create what you're about to see today. And I also... <laughs> And it, we've been talking about bringing this film to Ebert Fest ever since we started on this years ago now, and here we are at last. And I'm also so thrilled that the festival brought Tommy Myrick to Champaign Urbana here to be with us this afternoon. May I invite Tommy out? Yeah. Tommy plays Maria Mathis, the lead actress. Here she is. <laughs> all the way from New Orleans and you're going to see one of the most ravishing women and ravishing performances on screen that you've ever seen thank you so very much <laughs> I want to thank Chaz and Sandra for inviting me here it's sort of a, a gentleman asked me how I felt and I, I told him it's kind of a bittersweet um 38 years later, okay, this is what Maria Mathis looks like, okay? I, um, I'm going to make this short because I know you, you're interested in seeing the film. I will say that uh, I am um, uh, a native New Orleanian, even though I was uh, uh, seeking fame and fortune in New York at the time that I was asked to play this, this particular role. Um, I do want to say the, the, the bitterness comes from the fact that uh, about 60, 65% of the people who uh, helped make this film happen uh, are no longer with us. They have transitioned. Um, and to be standing here 38 years later is uh, weird. Um, uh, last but not least, I will tell you that I had 
uh, sort of put the film out of my head years ago. And then I got a text in October from a friend of mine that said, congratulations. And I texted her back and I said, thank you, but for what? And she said, Cane River is in the New Orleans Film Festival. I said, what? <laughs> yes. Richard Romaine, my leading man, that was his first and only acting job uh, that he ever did. Um, he would be with us, but he already had plans for his, he and his family to be in Costa Rica this weekend, so he couldn't make it. But on behalf of New Orleans and um, Maria Therese Corn Corn and uh, Pierre Matoya of Cane River, I will end, of course, on behalf of Horace and Carol Baltazar. Uh, thank you for welcoming this film and may it continue to, to, to raise their spirits higher. Thank you and I hope you enjoy the film. <laughs> 